Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey, everybody. Today's guest is Jim Abrams. Jim is a well-known and loved program assistant I met when we PA'd together in Boston. On today's show, we talk about addiction, trauma, faith, cancer, and pain. We're going to jump right in, so enjoy. Jim, what first drew you to IFS? So I was in counseling with somebody who was not an IFS therapist, and um, and frankly, he, he, he liked to chat and then he liked to do a lot of interpretations and analysis and it was very heady um and um and i liked him very much but it wasn't going very well and um and he had taken a one-day workshop with dick and uh he came back and sort of explained it to me and it seemed patently obvious that that made sense and i said okay let's try it and he wasn't very good at it but i got very interested in it and um, so I signed up for a level one training and then I asked one of the PAs to recommend a good IFS therapist. And the one I'd been seeing had a lot of integrity and wasn't ego, t- ego involved at all. And he just said, of course. So he let me transfer to this uh, IFS therapist. And frankly, the first couple of years I learned the most being a client as opposed to uh, being a practitioner. Yeah, well, that's something I think is a little bit different about IFS is that, you know, if when I learned cognitive behavioral therapy, I didn't necessarily have to go to a cognitive behavioral therapist in order to learn it. Um, But with IFS, it is one of the first recommendations is that we go to an IFS therapist. That's because it's, it's experiential. It's not so intellectual. If you try to think about what are parts as opposed to talking to parts, once you get a handle on on this sort of aspect of our natures that you can have a conversation with it becomes real and useful so I I think that's right I think and I learned a lot of just sort of seeing what he did that worked well with me so I think up until I experienced IFS we had this sort of presumption that our minds are a singularity that we have that we're one we're one integrated or disintegrated being that that has a series of thoughts and that our moods come and go and our thoughts come and go but that's all part of us being one person inside and ifs teaches a different model which is which is that in fact we're a a a corporate entity of many, many different parts, some of whom we're aware of at any given moment and others were not, some of whom actually can hold opposite points of view. And, um, and I think any experienced therapist, I had worked for 30 years before I learned IFS, um, sort of understands that there are these genuinely different sub-personalities, whether they use them as metaphors or as real parts, so that you talk about the parent voice or a little child voice. And, and you know, there's all those aspects of of work that you come to that you that just makes sense and then when that model was explained it just seemed yes that that's I've sort of been doing that but just not with a lot of discipline or or protocol um I wasn't doing it very well I like that you're like yes I just when it's explained you're like yes that just is yeah it makes sense yeah yeah um so we talked about this idea of using the model to explain why people behave in certain ways. And I know you work a lot with addiction. Yes. So can you spend some time talking about that with understanding addiction with this model? So I think everybody experiences trauma early in their lives. It doesn't matter if it's big trauma, like being abused and beat up or, or abandoned, or whether it's little trauma like being told we're just not good enough in all sorts of myriad ways that happens. But at some point or another, we develop this, a sense of a deeper inner sense of, 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 of brokenness and of not okayness. And that, that, that aspect of this deeper aspect carries some shame and, um, and, and 
so for example, a child who's who's a child whose parents are not paying adequate attention would naturally assume that it must be something wrong with him, that well, he wasn't getting what he needed. Um, he has no other way to understand that. So he develops a, a, an idea about himself that, be, that actually perpetuates itself regardless of circumstances, so that anytime anybody later in life isn't very nice to him, he, he, that, that, that meaning sort of activates and creeps back up and says, I told you, you just aren't very likable or you're not very worthy or you're not very, um, you, you're never going to amount to anything or whatever these inner voices are that, that, that somebody takes on. And it becomes a point, it becomes, it gets to a point in which it can't be, it's hard to function with that much negativity going on. So we develop these protector systems that allow us to push all of that away and to keep it out of our consciousness. Unfortunately, it's very easy for people to get addicted. And we think of addiction as drugs and alcohol, but I don't know about you, but around nine o'clock at night, I like to go find what's in the kitchen and go back and back and back. And, and I think many, many of us have habits and patterns that, that um, whether it's always looking at our phone anytime we get a spare moment, uh, we, have, we have many patterns that enable us to, to uh, protect those broken parts of us that are deep down inside in a way that um, creates some distraction and relief and, and the like. Yeah. Jim, that is beautiful and a beautiful description of why we behave in ways that is so ugly. You know, we behave in these ugly ways, but the way you just described that is that you know the, the ways that I behave that I don't like is protective, is a part of me protecting me. And the part of you that doesn't like them is a part of you. Mm, okay. So there's a part of you that wants you to be well behaved and that thinks that you need to be able to manage your behavior in order to be acceptable in the world and and loved by your parents and 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 uh, holy and and a good person and all those other kinds of higher values are actually a part. The problem is that that part hates the part of you that wants to eat chocolate or that wants to have a cigarette or that wants to go gamble or that wants to look at porn or that wants to have an extra drink or three or four and so forth. And so in working with addiction, recognizing that each of these parts has good intentions is very helpful. Yeah. I mean, I think it's such a different way of looking at addiction. Right. So shame-based, you know, the more I go to the kitchen to get the chocolate, the more I hear you're so fat, you're never gonna, you're never gonna lose weight. You're just a fatty, and then I just want to eat more chocolate. Exactly, the the manager that hates the acting out part of you adds shame to a system that's already protecting against shame, and so the part that wants to relieve you of feeling terrible about yourself by eating chocolate gets more activated and then the part that feels that that's out of control and is terrible and is ruining your life gets more activated and that's the addictive cycle. And what a different way of looking at addiction. Right. So in working with addicts, the thing to do is to get permission from the part that hates the part that wants to act out. But let, it's, it's, we pathologize this whole thing so much in our society that we name it as addiction as opposed to a part that is trying to solve a problem in a bad way. The little oh. girl who is in seventh grade and who's not very social and doesn't feel very attractive can soothe herself by getting to ha developing an unhealthy relationship with chocolate. And, and the little boy that is, that is in seventh or eighth grade that is socially very shy and not very well accepted when he has a drink or two suddenly has this very sharp attractive sense of humor and people start to aggro to, to be attracted to him and you know he's going to want to have a drink and and so i describe to people who are working with addictions that that the addictive behavior is like grabbing onto a log in tumultuous waters and it gets you through it works yeah but now they fall in love with the log and can't let go okay yeah and so i talk to the part of them that that hates that part and ask for permission to 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 get to know it better, not to endorse it and not to, to tell it that everything's fine because the behavior is a problem, but to get to know it better because there's a better way of protecting the person than trying to shut that down because shutting it down isn't working very well. So Jim, I just want to map this out just so it, it makes sense in my head. So if we're talking about you know, my eating chocolate, I would say, no, 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 Jim, I want to Focus on the part of me that overeats chocolate. That's right. 
want to focus on. But you're saying before we focus on that part, I really need to focus on the part of me that hates that part. Right. The one that calls you fat and says, what are you doing to yourself? Okay. Because that part doesn't want you to spend any time with it. It wants you to shut it out. It wants you to make it go away. It wants you to, to tell it it's terrible and just stop as if somehow self-willpower alone would work very well beyond an evening or two. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And so that is that is the first step then in working with people with addiction. And I like that you're, what you're saying though is it's not just people with addiction. We all have addictions. We all have habits that we don't like. But that first step is working with the part that doesn't like it. Another way to say that is we all have hyperactive managers because is at the at the conference, Dick talked about primal shame. Did you go to that? I did. Yes. You no. Know, and so we 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 all. It's historically, evolutionarily important for a child to feel that that he's worthy of love and that if if. If somehow he or she starts to feel insufficient or inadequate, it's a life or death deal because in, in, in tribes where there wasn't enough to go around, they would leave a broken or, 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 or um, um, a child that, that, what, that isn't attractive, they'd probably leave it alone and, and let it die. And so, so it's, I think it's built in. And so there's, there's, we develop these, these voices inside that tell us we have to be good. We have to be good. We have to, and, and those parts believe that if, as long as we do everything perfectly, nothing bad can happen. Well, and it sounds like then my habits or my addictions are really ways to maintain being good in some ways. Like, no, the, the, voices, the voices telling you you shouldn't do that are an effort to make you be good. Okay. Parts of you that are acting out or that don't want to work or that want to procrastinate or that want to just take a nap or want to read a book or, 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 or want to take a walk and don't feel like being productive are trying to provide some relief against the relentlessness of the voices that always want you to be good. That in some ways sounds so simple. <laughs> But it, it, but it's true, and, and just recognizing that doesn't make the behaviors that are extreme okay. But it makes the obvious intentionality that they're that that they're not bad in their nature. They're trying to provide balance. They're trying to actually provide self care. They're trying to help you to take care of yourself. They're just not doing it in a very smart way. Yeah. So what have you seen in your life, or even in the lives of the people that you work with? What a difference just this shift of not hating that behavior part of me, the part of me that acts out. What are you seeing from just that alone? It's huge. I do a lot of consulting to businesses still, and, and so I don't get a chance to do sort of in-depth IFS, working with deeper parts in that way. But, but just being able to validate that the nature, that somebody's coming from a place that's well-intended and having them see that, whether they're talking about somebody they're aggravated with, whether they're talking about parts of themselves, is enormously valuable. And it's true. So it tends to, to land well once they kind of get their heads around it. So Jim, you and I did talk one time about um, what it is like for using this model in a faith-based population. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, so I work with Christians and, um, and Jews, but mostly Christians. And there's a natural affinity to IFS because IFS is, has a fundamentally spiritual nature. This idea of self-energy that is embedded and that is, that, is, that is born and doesn't need to be matured and that has this energy of healing and, and, and compassion and calmness and curiosity and open-heartedness. And it fits naturally with, by the way, I have to share that not everybody would agree with me on this, especially more Orthodox people. So they, if they don't believe it and they listen to this, have them keep what they believe. But I just want to share my, my understanding of it, which is that I believe that the, the, no, the Christian notion of, of Holy Spirit seems to overlap almost entirely with the IFS notion of self-energy, that it is embedded, that it, that, that, I believe is what it means when they say that God, we are made in God's image, that he embedded his loving spirit in our hearts. And that, and that part of the way of working with people is to ask them to open their hearts towards their parts. And I think when they open their hearts, they're channeling that loving, holy, divine energy. And Tammy, it really is more powerful than just a grown-up 
part of you talking to a child part of you. It's got more strength. It's, it makes a bigger difference. And these parts seem to know that. So I believe that there's something divine going on. And actually, I asked Dick Schwartz about that, and he said, so do I. So That's, Yeah, and as, as they're saying that, I was thinking about how the difference that would make is, is not just, you know, me and self loving my parts, but that the divine love through me is loving my parts. And I think for so many people, they might even accept that a little bit more. Than I'm some do, and some, some, if it's not coming from God externally, then it doesn't feel real to them. And, and eventually they start to experience the power of that love, and then it becomes less of an issue. Mm. But cerebrally, there's, or, or conceptually, they some have a hard time with it. But there is a biblical reason for it, which is, which is we are all made in God's image. It's called general revelation. And so, although some of the Bible teaches that you have to believe in Jesus in order to have access to the Holy Spirit, but if we're all made in God's image, then, and maybe we'll call it something else, but it clearly is the love of God that we are feeling. So most Christians that I work with have an easy time sort of accessing and believing in self-energy, which is important. Because people who don't, their parts just don't want to give up control. Jesus was was tempted by Satan four times in the in the desert before he began his ministry. And so it is a natural default position to assume that the temptation is coming from the enemy, from Satan. Okay. So I have to reframe that with the conversation we just had earlier, that this is a broken part of you that needs love and compassion and caring, and that with that will come help. There is room for evil spirits. We, we, call, them, um, we call them unattached burdens, but that uh, this idea that your nature is somehow evil, that's what's making you want to eat at night or do whatever it is that you define as a bad habit is is of Satan gets in the way of bringing healing there by calling it nasty names and exiling it. You can't bring God's love into that space. And that's the language I use. It works. Well, and again, it's a yes, because it's like, okay, that feels really true. And even if so, it's just a different way of thinking of how evil's working. Like evil isn't necessarily the part of me, right. the part of me that's doing the, the the bad thing. So Jim, what, I guess I'm curious about how, what IFS has meant to you. Cause I, I can sort of hear it as you're talking, I'm curious about it for you and your. So I, I, I can, I can answer that. I mean, it's, it's beyond words. It's changed the way that I understand who I am and how I'm made and how you are made and how the people that I'm behaving with and how they're behaving towards me, I don't know. Yeah, they, right, well, the I don't know is part of the like, I can't, it's an experience. No, there was, I don't know if I wanna talk about this, but I, oh, okay. I'll, I'll just, okay. I, I, I think I will. So I, I don't know if you know this, but I went through a very severe bout of cancer and it was stage four and, and it had already metastasized and it's, it's prostate cancer, which is glandular. So the way in which they treat that besides the operation and radiation was to take away the hormones that fuels the prostate cells, which is devastating to your body because it takes away your vitality and your, your muscles shrink and your bones soften and and um, and your system just doesn't like not having it. But I would wake up in the middle of the night or wake up in the morning with pain and with with joint pain and fatigue that was overwhelming. I thought of each of the parts of me that needed, that were worried about what's going to happen next, or that were tired of being tired, or that that were just so pain, in pain. I thought of them as just kind of little kids that needed to be tucked in and held. I leaned into that energy every morning. It gave me, it got me through. I was like, these parts still were in pain, but they weren't alone with it. And and um, and then thankfully, I had work that mattered. So I could then be other oriented and focus outwardly, but that spirit of his, his spirit or that general feeling that, that self energy feeling that was taking care of me as I experienced that gave me a sense of gratitude and joy and, and um, built my confidence in it. It's always there. Like the sun behind the clouds, the clouds just have to be willing to, 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 to part. And so it's made a huge difference in my life. It's a huge difference in my life. But also, for example, if, if my wife talks to me in an impatient way, parts generate parts, they elicit parts. So a, 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 an attacking part tends to generate in me and a 
part that wants to attack back. And sometimes it does, but oftentimes I recognize that she's in a part and that she must be really tired or that she must be injured or I must have said something or whatever. And if I can talk to her in a, in a, in a way that recognizes that, that it's not very pleasant, but it's, well, it's trying to protect her in some fashion, then I can talk to her with some curiosity and an open heart. And it tends, self-energy also elicits self-energy. So if I talk to her in a, in, a, in, a, in a loving way, it tends to diffuse the moment quickly. Jim, you just said so many beautiful things. Um, and I just want to say, before we talk about marriage, <laughs> that I just really appreciate you sharing with me and sharing with the listeners your personal story and something that's so vulnerable and really amazing. And I think about the people that are listening that have pain, right. their pain different. And that just, that would be life changing. That would, that would change the quality of their life if they could relate to their pain in the way you related to your pain. I, I hope that doesn't create an expectation that they should automatically. It, it, I had already worked with these, with, with parts in general and knew that there were parts of me that I had other voices, the parts that were saying, Jim, just toughen up. There's people with polio. There's, you're not dying for heaven's sakes. You're not yet. And so I had voices like that that I also had to, had to say, okay, it makes sense. I know you're there. Give me some space so I can love these parts that feel so sad or feel so tired. And well, it, it, is, it doesn't sound judgmental at all. It sounds like an idea of a different way of relating to pain. So Jim, so here's my IRL problem. When I come to my husband and I say, I need amount of money for Christmas, I feel really frustrated and really angry because he wants me to spend a lot less. And I'm like, their expectations, my dad and my mom and nieces, and I have all these people that I need to spend for. And I just get really frustrated with him. And then he's frustrated with me and I go spend double the amount. <laughs> That, I, that, that he tells me that I'm allowed to spend. So tell me what's happening. Of course, we're just making this up, right? Yeah, right. This is not true at all. Okay. <laughs> so how do you understand this voice inside of you that, that um, is frustrated? Hmm. You're using the I word. So I'm just curious. How do you understand that? That is such a good question because I don't know that I, as a voice or a part, feels like this frustration that I can't do whatever I want to do. Which makes total sense, right? <laughs> Doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, and no one's going to tell me what to do or limit me. That's, that's, we get that about three years old and it stays with us the rest of our lives, doesn't it? And it's funny because I didn't even think about that's what it was. I just was like, he just needs to do this. But right, it's that I want to do what I want to do. Of course. So, so it's important that when we blend it with the part that is who we are at that moment, that we see that as our entire worldview, he's getting in the way of you're doing what you want to do and what the hell's the matter with him and, and so <laughs> forth. And, exactly. so. And, and, and when you were three, you would have hit your head on the bottom of the, on the floor of the supermarket and got what you wanted eventually. But, but now you're too adult for that. So you just get mad. It's a part and it's a part that truly wants what it wants and has every right to want what it wants, but it may or may not be good for your marriage. So it may be helpful for you to befriend that part and just to understand that, that um, it, it has every right to it, but to understand more what, what it really needs from you at the moment. Well, and I think that's the thing that's so interesting is, is talking, I was thinking, I feel like what the part's telling me and what I, what I think is really blended is, well, what I need is for him to just to do what I want to do. Well, of course. Right. But then when I do that U-turn and I really focus on what that part is telling me and what that part needs from me and how I can be with that part, I'm actually not talking about my husband anymore at all. I think that is that feels very different for me because right. now I'm talking about me and my parts. And you can focus on him, too. I wonder what part he's in that's scared about spending money and where, what, how that comes to some sort of protective position for him because it doesn't feel very loving or generous. So you have every right to have feelings about that. But if you can be curious about it and say, whoa, what, what just triggered with him? Because you know in his life, he sometimes is generous. Yeah. So what's going on? And to be curious about that doesn't mean you'll fix it or change it, but to understand it better in a more loving voice, if you will, often changes the way that he experiences you and then he gets less defensive and you can come to some sort of understanding. Jim, that is great because it's like, right, if, if I'm 
if I'm trying to have this conversation in that frustration or it, with that frustrated part driving the bus, we're not going to get anywhere because my- doesn't get any better, does it? No, no. Right. And then I can see him and just seeing him with his eyes of curiosity. Right. And when my wife talks to me impatiently, it triggers in me immediate impatience. And I found that getting mad at her doesn't make her less impatient. <laughs> Sometimes doesn't stop me from the initial reaction, but it certainly doesn't seem to work well. <laughs> but trying to understand what's going on for her does. Mm, oh, that's beautiful. Jim, I have one, uh, one more question and then, and then you can go on with your evening. Um, if you were not a therapist, or I, you're not a therapist, though, are you? You're a practitioner. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. So if you weren't doing the thing that you're doing, because you do lots of different things with IFS and um, businesses. So, but if you weren't doing that, what would you do instead? I love to teach, um, and I do a lot of teaching. So um, I am doing what I want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of retired, so I get to do what I want to do. Um, but I also, this is going to, in response to, there's a part of me that would love to be a ski instructor. Fun. It's one of the things I can still do, like I could do when I was really young and, and agile and athletic. And, um, and uh, I can't do it as long, but I can do it as well. And I teach it really well. There's lots of people that are brand new skiers that ski pretty well at the end of the day with me. So that would be fun to do. Have a, a ski place that you like to go to? I go to Wachusett. It's 20 minutes from my house and I have a season pass and I go in the middle of the week where there's nobody there and ski for three or four hours and then leave or two or three hours and leave. Not every day, but maybe once or twice a week. Amazing. Have you been skiing yet? Yeah, yesterday. You went yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Jim, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Yes, I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.